Sigmund Freud's Totem and Taboo is a bit of genius written by a genius. The only problem is that it is based on faulty assumptions and arrives at incorrect conclusions. Those that know its inadequacies cast a forgiving eye at Freud and just dismiss it as a silly error in an otherwise overwhelmingly rich body of work. Others, not knowing its inadequacies, have nothing better to replace it with. Go on reciting the psychoanalytic myth of the primal father and his murder by the clan of brothers. But in a sense, neither is taking seriously the reason Freud wrote Totem and Taboo. It was written as an attempt to come to terms with the relationship between psychological ontogeny and psychological phylogeny. That is the relationship between psychological development of an individual and the psychological development of the species. The phylogenetic project of psychoanalysis draws significantly on the work of Darwin and Haeckel, begins with Freud and is carried forth by Sandor Ferenczi, Theodor Reich, Hazel Roheim, and others. Totem and Taboo is a serious effort to come to terms with some very big questions in psychoanalysis, such as where did the Oedipus complex come from? What is the origin of universal symbolism? What is the history of our modern day psychological structure? What is the relationship between the individual and the group? How do we understand the relationship between libido development and cultural evolution, and so on? These are the metapsychological questions that are of little interest to many, and yet were of central interest to Freud. In this, the first of three presentations, we will examine Freud's totem and taboo, recognize the genius in his efforts and the errors in his ways with the goal of setting the stage for a new contribution to the phylogenetic project of psychoanalysis. Ernst Haeckel, uh, Ernst Haeckel's theory of biogenesis states that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. That is, that the development of the individual member of a species recapitulates or goes through the embryonic stages which recall earlier stages in the development of that species. In other words, as embryos, we go through stages that resemble the animal's ancestors of our primordial past. As embryos, we have tails, limbs that look like those of a quadruped, and even gill-like structures similar to a fish. Haeckel was one of Darwin's most creative, enthusiastic, and influential champions. While biogenesis has long since been discredited and abandoned as a post-Darwinian evolutionary theory, it continued for quite some time as a compelling concept for understanding the relationship between psychological development and cultural evolution. It was a concept used to understand the way the child seemingly revisits through its psychological development the stages of cultural evolution. In The Origin of Species, by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, the total uh, title of The Origin of the Species, Darwin laid down the concepts and observations leading to his revolutionary theory. He supported the new idea that the world was not thousands of years old with a cataclysmic history, but was millions and millions of years old, and that the small geological changes that made it what it is today are still active. With the notion of the mutability of species and millions of years to evolve, he asserted that the various species mutated and either died out or survived based on natural selection. In other words, those with mutations most suitable to their environment survived and those that were not became extinct. Then he added to this the concept of sexual selection based on the struggle between males for possession of the females permitting more successful males to leave more offspring. Then, in 1871, Darwin published The Descent of Man and the Selection in Relation to Sex and noted that humans, monkeys, apes, and mammals in general must endure a lengthy period of helplessness after birth. 
that the appearance of the human ovule differs in no great way from the ovules of other animals, and that the human fetus appears similar to the fetus, fetuses of other animals, that the bodies of many animals have rudimentary features and functions which are echoes of a utility in the distant past but are vestigial in contemporary times. Darwin, using man as an example, wrote, quote, from the presence of the woolly hair or lanugo on the fetus and of rudimentary hairs scattered over the body during maturity, we may infer that man is descended from some animal which was born hairy and remained so during life, unquote. Darwin says that since we have the same senses as many lower animals, our fundamental intuitions must be the same. And then Darwin writes, quote, Man has also some few instincts in common as that of self-preservation, sexual love, the love of the mother for her newborn offspring, the power possessed of the latter of sucking, and so forth. Unquote. But beyond self-preservation, Darwin points out that there are social instincts as well, which give rise to moral behavior above and beyond the motivating forces of pleasure and pain. He recounts the social and frankly altruistic behavior of animals and considers the inheritance of moral behavior. Darwin points out that the acquisition of the social instincts is not a calm elevation of the spirit, but a constant conflict for the member of the group, whether it be human or a member of the lower animal world. As a struggle may sometimes be going on between various instincts of the lower animals, it is not surprising that there should be a struggle in man between his social instincts with their derived virtues and his lower, though at the moment, stronger impulses or desires. As a struggle may sometimes be seen going on between various instincts of the lower animals, it is not surprised that that struggle should continue to take place in the heart and mind of man. Darwin, with fossils and skulls, of non-human primates scattered about on his desk mused on our prehistoric past, our anatomic evolution. These fossils and skulls marked stages in the evolution of our species. He wrote, if we look far enough back in the stream of time, it is extremely improbable that primeval men and women lived promiscuously together. Judging from the social habits of man as he now exists, and from the most savages, uh, and from most savages being polygamous, the most probable view is that the primeval man, aboriginally, lived in small communities, each with as many wives as he could support and obtain, whom he would have jealously guarded against all other men, or he may have lived with several wives by himself, like the gorilla, for all the natives agree that but one adult male is seen in a band. When the young male grows up, a contest takes place for mastery, and the strongest, by killing or driving out the others, establishes himself as the head of the community." Unquote. This scenario of a jealous primeval male battling with his rivals and even killing them in order to obtain and guard the females against other males, and thereby becoming head of the community, fit in so nicely with Freud's concept of the Oedipus conflict that he even used the above citation in Totem and Taboo. Freud, with his antiquities scattered about his desk, mused on our prehistoric past, our cultural evolution. These antiquities marked stages in the evolution of our culture and stages in the evolution of the psyche. Describing the early steps towards setting the course for his career, Freud wrote of his early childhood engrossment in the Bible and his later interest in the theories of Darwin. In medical school, Freud studied during the course of four semesters general biology, Darwinism, anatomy, and zoology. As a teenager, Freud was fascinated by Darwin and Haeckel, and at 18, planned to take his PhD 
in philosophy and zoology. These interests were probably the earliest stirrings of what was to become Freud's metapsychological thinking about the phylogenetic origins of consciousness, in which he would try to come to terms with the universality of the Oedipus complex, the archaic inheritance of dream symbolism, and the nature of our prehistoric past. These were questions that concerned him deeply from his adolescence in the 1870s until his final major work, Moses and Monotheism, published in 1939, shortly before his death. Freud, grappling with the recurring themes in human behavior, concluded that humans, like other animals, had certain inherited predispositions. Underline under inherited. Universal sexual symbolism and primal fantasies he attributed to inherited phylogenetic memories, our archaic inheritance. Then, based on the overwhelming clinical evidence of the Oedipus complex, he took his boldest speculative leap and reconstructed in outline the events of our prehistoric past, the memories of which he asserted we have inherited onto genetically. He wrote, the prehistory into which the dream work leads us back is of two kinds. On the one hand, into the individual's prehistory, his childhood, and on the other, insofar as each individual somehow recapitulates in an abbreviated form the entire development of the human race, his phylogenetic prehistory, too, unquote. He says further, dreams bring to light material which cannot have originated either from the dreamer's adult life or from his forgotten childhood. We are obliged to regard it as part of the archaic heritage which a child brings with him into the world before any experience of his own, influenced by the experiences of his ancestors. Elsewhere he states, quote, the experiences of the id seem at first to be lost for inheritance, but when they have been repeated often enough and with sufficient strength in many individuals in successive generations, they transform themselves, so to say, into experiences of the id, the impressions of which are preserved by heredity. Thus, in the which is capable of being inherited, are harbored residues of the existences of countless egos. And when the ego forms its superego out of the id, it may perhaps only be reviving shapes of former egos and be bringing them to resurrection. Recalling the observation of Darwin and the biologists of the previous generation that human offspring have a particularly long period of dependence on their parents in relation to other animals, Freud added the observation that love passes a particularly complicated course for humans. Quote, Consequently, the overcoming of the Oedipus complex coincides with the most efficient way of mastering the archaic animal heritage of humanity." Unquote. Now imagine that. The animal heritage of incestuous desire, jealousy, bitter rivalry, and murderous impulses, he's saying, are mollified and modified under the influence of the Oedipus complex, wherein gender and generational differences are established. Identifications are made, and fraternity becomes a part of the foundation of culture. And every child passing through the Oedipus complex must relive this primordial past in the context of his or her family in relation to one's parents and siblings. It is a drama of our phylogenetic heritage taking place in the intrapsychic conflict and on the stage of familial relations. Whether one agrees with Freud or not, one cannot help but be impressed by the scope and courage of his creative mind. But he did not stop there. It was not enough to recognize the structure of the Oedipus complex in his self-analysis and in the dreams and free associations of his patients. No. Freud had to understand the historical and prehistorical origins of this universal complex. He had already discovered that Sophocles' play, Oedipus Rex, and a fair number of other myths, legends, and works of art 
contain the basic Oedipal structure of a heroic figure in the position of being in love with his mother and in mortal combat with his father. But was it just an interesting analogy? Was there more to it? Could the myths and legends of all time be more than creative expressions of the past? Could they not be faded memories of something that really happened? Freud's Totem and Taboo, Some Points of Agreement Between the Mental Lives of Savages and Neurotics, the full title of Totem and Taboo, is presented in four essays, The Horror of Incest, Taboo and Emotional Ambivalence, Animism, Magic, and the Omnipotence of Thoughts, and The Return of Totemism in Childhood. We will review each in brief. In his first essay, The Horror of Incest, Freud takes up the question of the universal abhorrence of incest and seeks to understand this phenomenon in the context of tribal life among the Aborigines of Australia. The idea being that an understanding of these Aboriginal people would give us clues or even a glimpse into our ancestors and our own primordial past. Freud introduces us to the Australian Aborigines, social and religious institution of totemism based on ancestor worship, wherein the primal ancestor is seen as an animal or plant that is said to be the father of the clan. The totem must not be killed or eaten except on special occasions, and the members of one clan must avoid sexual relations with members of the same clan. Thus, one must always marry outside of one's clan. This is called totemic exogamy. Freud describes the restrictions against marriage within one's clan and the intricate steps taken by the, Aboriginal, uh, the, the Australian Aborigines to avoid any chance of sexual relations with one's mother, sisters, and mother-in-law. While the restrictions were elaborate, the punishment for transgressing the restrictions were harsh death or almost death by stoning or being speared. Freud writes, quote, it is of no small importance that we are able to show that these same incestuous wishes, which are later destined to become unconscious, are still regarded by savage peoples as immediate perils against which the most severe punishment, of the, the, the most severe measures of defense must be enforced, unquote. In other words, as modern humans, we possess within our psychic makeup and cultural survivals or traces of our ancestors and their early experiences on the path of cultural evolution. Thus, the horror of incest is not innate. It is a defensive strategy which was exerted consciously and with great effort in our prehistoric past to manage the socially disruptive incestuous desires. In other words, underneath every incest taboo is an incestuous desire. In his second essay, Taboo and Emotional Ambivalence, Freud describes taboos as restrictions or prohibitions on behavior to avoid calamitous occurrences. That is, if one touches something belonging to a shaman, for example, or touches a menstruating woman, death, illness, or disaster befalls the person or the community. Freud notes the resemblance between taboos within a totemic or formal religious context and the obsessions of obsessive compulsive patients who develop rules and rituals to avoid causing damage or death to self and others. This is where we get a chance to see the real genius of Freud when he's able to make such an extraordinary leap from a cultural phenomenon to something he's observing in his clinical work. There is fear and danger in both. An object of fear and danger as well as an extraneous other object onto which the fear and danger has been displaced. Both the totemic and obsessive compulsive rituals associated with taboos avoid danger by abstaining from certain foods, lighting candles, saying prayers, 
taking away an even number of sheets of toilet paper, uttering special words, checking four times to be sure the stove is off or the door is locked, uh, repeated hand washing, etc. The ritual associated with the taboo object is a compromise between prohibition and the instinct. He notes that chiefs and kings have historically been seen as figures of great power that others had to avoid touching or even avoid touching their belongings for fear of death. Beneath all the ceremonial taboos of veneration and idolization the kings received from their subjects was an intense undercurrent of hostility. In Animism, Magic, and the Omnipotence of Thoughts, uh, uh, Freud links the omnipotence of thoughts, a common neurotic mechanism for managing overwhelming experience, with the primitive man's magic and animism. He's linking those two. Animism is a philosophical system that explains much of the world by filling it with the belief in spirits, demons, and souls. The notion of the soul is said to have originated in the observation that and attempts to explain sleep, dreams, and death. The animistic system of the universe provides explanatory power, but is also accompanied by magic and sorcery as techniques for controlling said spirits, demons, and souls. Cannibalism is based on the magical principle that the qualities of a person can be incorporated or internalized by another when their flesh is literally eaten. This has also given rise to various food taboos which foreclose the incorporation of undesirable or even malevolent qualities. Freud found this magical thinking or omnipotence of thoughts in the thinking and play of children, the magical animistic world of the primitive adult, and in the thought processes of the neurotic. Okay, so Freud is stringing pearls here. He has such extraordinarily different phenomena. He's looking at childhood, uh, the belief system of totemic uh, uh, religions, and the belief systems of the neurotic patients. And he's finding something in common, which he's describing as animism, magic, and the omnipotence of thoughts. In an attempt to bridge psychological development with cultural evolution, Freud writes, quote, the animistic phase would correspond to narcissism, both chronologically and in its content. The religious phase would correspond to the stage of object choice, of which the characteristic is a child's attachment to his parents, while the scientific phase would have an exact counterpart, counterpart in the stage at which an individual has reached maturity, has renounced the pleasure principle, adjust himself to, adjusted himself to reality, and turned to the external world for the object of his desires." Unquote. Freud asserts that spirits and demons are the projections of man's own impulses into the outer world. He attributes the origin of spirits and demons to early man's experience of the deaths of loved ones. The magical actions designed to ward off the danger of the taboo object, the dead person, for example, protected the living from the ghost of the dead and also from the ambivalent feelings of sorrow for the loss and the repressed death wishes. As a function of the magical actions, the repression was facilitated and made possible the earliest instinctual renunciations of our ancient ancestors. And instinctual renunciation is the basis of the development of both ego and culture. In his essay, The Return of Totemism in Childhood, Freud brought together the observations and insights of evolutionary anthropology with his clinical observations and insights and then took a speculative leap of absolutely majestic proportions. He would not call it a hypothesis, but rather a vision. Freud employed psychological Lamarckism, the notion that acquired experiences of individuals are passed on to subsequent generations. The biogenetic law 
that the individual repeats the history of its species in its own development, and Darwin's hypothesis regarding the earliest social state of primitive peoples. Darwin observing the habits of the higher apes and man deduced that we humans, in our prehistoric past, lived in small groups or hordes under the domination of the oldest and strongest male, who kept as many wives as he could support, jealously guarded them from the sexual promiscuity of the younger, weaker males, and drawing on the work of Dr. Savage, Darwin added that among gorillas there is typically only one adult male per band. When the younger males grow up, there's a contest of strength in which the stronger drives out the others. Freud then noted that it was Atkinson who recognized that when the others move on, they tacitly established a tradition of exogamy. And Andrew Lang then made the connection between exogamy and totemism, which Freud found so useful. This exogamy, or marrying outside one's group, is a tradition based on the horror of incest, which, as we learned, is a thin cover for incestuous desires. There is no need for a prohibition where there is no desire, and in the family and the clan there are always temptations. Thus the prohibition against incest was a taboo established by the totem figure of the group in order to maintain social harmony. The two taboos of totemism are the taboo against harming the totem and the taboo against sexual relations within the clan. Freud further supported, supported Robertson Smith's hypothesis that the periodic sacramental killing and feasting on the body of the totemic animal, which was strictly taboo at other times, was an important feature of the totemic belief system. Freud finally introduces the psychoanalytic interpretation that the totemic animal was a substitute for the primal father of the horde killed in primeval times by the brothers who transformed the dead father into a totem to worship and periodically recall his murder and mourn him again in the sacrificial totemic meal. He writes, the totem meal, which is perhaps mankind's earliest festival, would thus be a repetition and a commemoration of this memorial and criminal deed, of this memorable and criminal deed, which was the beginning of so many things, of social organization, of moral restrictions, and of religion. Freud was building a rough schema of cultural evolution from the patriarchal horde to the totemic brother clan to the religious world to our modern scientific Weltanschauung. His focus was on the first two stages, and particularly the transition to the totemic brother clan. Freud muses that after the brothers banded together and slew the hated primal despotic father, they felt triumphant at first, but then their love, admiration, identification, and affection for the primal father reemerged in the form of remorse guilt for the original sin. To manage these feelings, they brought the father back to life, so to speak, in the form of the totem. To ensure his longevity, he became a class of animal or plant rather than just one being. They attempted to undo their primal crime by making it forbidden, taboo, to kill it, and resigned their claim to the women by establishing the sexual taboos and principles of exogamy. Freud writes, quote, as time went on, the animal lost its sacred character and the sacrifice lost its connection with the totem feast. It became a simple offering to the deity as an act of renunciation in favor of the god. God himself had become so far exalted above mankind that he could only be approached through an intermediary, the priest. At the same time, divine kings made their appearance in the social structure and introduced the patriarchal system into the state. It must be confessed that the revenge taken by the deposed and restored father was a harsh one. The dominance of authority was at its climax. The full title of Freud's little book is Totem and Taboo, Some Points of Agreement Between the Mental Lives of Savages and Neurotics. But the points of agreement 
are between more than just aboriginal peoples and neurotics. No, Freud was establishing points of agreement between a stage of normal development, the Oedipal stage, a form of psychopathology, neurosis in sort of a general way and more specifically obsessional neurosis, a stage in cultural development, totemic culture, a myth, the myth of totemism and maybe particularly the Oedipus myth, and a ritual, the sacrificial totemic feast. He was drawing all these things together. And the points of agreement are, in a sense, metaphors that are embedded in each uh, seemingly disparate phenomena. And these points of agreement, or metaphors, are the erotic desire for the mother and the horror of incest, and the desire to kill the father and the adoration of the father. So he, he's looking at metaphors and he's finding them recurring in these extraordinarily disparate phenomena. Perhaps the best guide to totem and taboo is Edwin Wallace's Freud and Anthropology, a, uh, a History and Reappraisal. Wallace shows how the modern anthropologists' first critiques of totem and taboo were of Freud's psycholamarchian assumptions of the inheritance of memories from one generation to the next, which was just just plain wrong. There's nothing one could really say about it. It's just wrong. We do not inherit the memories of our ancestors. In his use of the defunct uh, biogenetic law for understanding the ontogenetic reappearance of the Oedipus complex, this was their other big criticism, the biogenetic law of ontogeny recapitulating phylogeny. Um, and from there, they went on to criticize Freud and the evolutionary anthropologists who had already fallen out of fashion for their broad generalizations about the formal similarities uh, between different cultures and for not recognizing that many of the observed similarities were not a function of the unity or uniformity of the human mind and our phylogenetic memories, but simply a result of diffusion. That is direct contact between one group of people with another. The modern anthropologists were less interested in the similarities between different cultures and found more useful understanding in recognizing the unique differences between cultures and their respective theories. Uh, I, I'm sorry, in their respective histories. Thus, the overarching cultural pattern of totemism broke down under clo uh, closer examination of individual cultures and the thought of comparing a contemporary primitive culture with our primal ancestors became completely untenable. Freud's use of the notion that matriarchy preceded patriarchy was found to have no basis in fact. The constellation of characteristics defining totemism were found to be illusory. And the same was said about taboos. Robertson Smith's reconstruction of the totemic feast was disassembled and found to be lacking in ethno ethnographic data. Freud had made a good name for himself among the same anthropologists that cri criticized him for paying such close attention to personal history in the analysis of individuals. But when it came to speculation about cultural phenomena, Freud showed himself to be startlingly ahistorical. The idea that primitive people were childlike or in any way sexually immature didn't seem to have anything to do with the data obtained from field observations. And Margaret Mead found that the animism of contemporary peoples could not be entirely explained in terms of intellectual immaturity. Cultures could not be reduced to expressions of individual dynamics. They were found to be complex structures which were social in character and had elaborate histories. While Freud privileged instinctual determinants, Gardner, Sullivan, Horney, and Fromm saw sociocultural determinants of greater significance than Freud would attribute to them. Furthermore, Gardner, Roheim, and Wallace would all dismiss Freud's phylogenetic thinkings about the origins of the Oedipus complex and located it in biological, social, and psychological structure. Freud's speculations were blasted right and left and blasted repeatedly over a period of decades 
by the giants of anthropology, Franz Boas, Alfred Kroeber, Margaret Mead, Bronislaw Malinowski, Claude Levi-Strauss, and others. But the number and stature of these anthropologists and the continuing preoccupation with Freud's ideas revealed that as wrong as Freud was, he was still offering something that was compelling, a unified theory of human development that would not die. Referring to Freud's reception by anthropologists, Wallace writes, much of the negative criticism has been directed against Freud's explanation of totemism, where his ahistoricism is most marked and where he broaches the parasite idea. By contrast, his ideas on the incest taboo, on spirit, spirits as projections, on magic as wish fulfillment and omnipotence of thoughts, and on uh, ambivalence toward the dead have been fa favorably received uh, by those anthropologists. In 1913, Sandor Ferenczi wrote, quote, what we may conceive about the phylogenesis of the reality sense can at present be offered only as a scientific prediction. It is to be assumed that we shall someday succeed in bringing the individual stages in the development of the ego and the neurotic regression types of these into a parallel with the stages in the racial history of mankind. Just as, for instance, Freud found again in the mental life of the savage the characters of the obsessional neurosis." Unquote. In another place, uh, Ferenczi writes, in general, the development of the reality sense is represented by a succession of repressions to which mankind was compelled, not through spontaneous strivings toward development, but through necessity and through adjustment to a demanded renunciation. The first great repression is made necessary by the process of birth, which certainly comes about without active cooperation, without any intention on the part of the child. The fetus would much rather remain undisturbed longer in the womb, but it is cruelly turned out into the world, and it has to forget to repress the kinds of satisfactions it had got fond of, and adjust itself to new ones. The same cruel game is repaged in development. Ferenzi continues, it is perhaps allowable to venture the surmise that it was the geological changes in the surface of the earth with catastrophic consequences for primeval man that compelled repression of favorite habits and thus development. The catastrophes may have been the sites of repression in the history of racial development and the temporal localization and intensity of such catastrophes may have decided the character and the neuroses of the race. According to a remark of Professor Freud's, racial character is the precipitate of racial history. And finally, Ferenczi writes, having ventured so far beyond the knowable, we have no reason to shrink before the last analogy and from, begin and from bringing the great step in individual repression the latency period into connection with the last and greatest catastrophe that smote our primitive ancestors at a time when there were certainly human beings on earth. With the misery of the glacial period, which we still faithfully recapitulate in our individual life. In other words, the latency period is a psychological develop the latency period in psychological development is for Ferenzi a precipitate of the traumatic experience of the Ice Age during our cultural evolution. He actually said that. Furthermore, the prenatal intrauterine existence, characteristic of all mammals, is a recapitulation of our aquatic origins, and birth itself is a recapitulation of the great catastrophe of the recession of the oceans and the adaptation to existence on land. Thus. There is an ontogenesis, development of the individual, a phylogenesis, development of the species, and a parogenesis, the development of the arrangements for the protection of the germ cells. Well, in 1915, Freud had plans to write 12 essays, which were to be called Preliminaries in, to a Metapsychology. 
six were written and published, and they are the well-known uh, papers on uh, psychology. Um, and the others seem never to have been written or were lost. But in 1983, a draft of one of the lost essays was found by Ilse Gubrich Simitis in a trunk full of papers belonging to Ferenczi. It was called Overview of the Transference Neuroses, and it was an extension of some of Freud's grand speculations, which he had previously published in Totem and Taboo. In Overview of the Transference Neuroses, Freud linked the recurring and sequential themes of ontogenetic development with stages in cultural evolution, and then linked those pairs with specific forms of psychopathology. He says, that following the work of Fritz Wittles, the primal human animal lived its life in a rich environment where all needs were easily satisfied, and that this existence is memorialized in all the multifarious myths of primal paradise. Then drawing on the work of Ferenzi, Freud suggests that the privations of the Ice Ages made mankind generally anxious and gave rise to anxiety hysteria. In other words, the realistic perils of the Ice Age gave rise to realistic anxiety, but also a fear of anything new, and this is memorialized in normal development and in anxiety hysteria. As the hardships of the Ice Age continued, there emerged a conflict between self-preservation and the desire to procreate. A lack of food and a social need to limit procreation gave rise to perverse satisfactions and a regression of the libido to levels previous to genital primacy. Mankind was still speechless and the preconscious had not yet been established over the unconscious. The situation corresponded to conversion hysteria. As mankind learned to adjust to the Ice Age, men in particular learn to economize on their libido by, regress by regressing in their sexual activity to earlier phases, activating their intelligence, learning how to investigate the hostile world around them, inventing things with which to master their surroundings, and creating language. Language was magical and thoughts omnipotent. They held an animistic worldview imbued with magic, at the end of this epoch, humanity had disintegrated into primal hordes dominated by a strong and wise, brutal man who was to be seen as invulnerable and his possession of the women was not to be challenged. This stage marked the end of the Ice Age. Obsessional neurosis recapitulates this stage in an overemphasis on thinking, the tendency toward omnipotent thoughts, the inclination toward inviolable laws, and the struggle against brutal impulses that want to replace the love life only to result in compulsion. After the Ice Age, the next phase, or second generation, if you will, is characterized by the sons of the primal father being limited, driven off at the age of puberty, or being quite literally castrated and reduced to harmless laborers. It corresponds with dementia praecox in terms of the relinquishing of every love object, the disintegration of sublimation, and the regression to autoeroticism. While the older sons succumb to this horrible fate, the younger ones have opportunity to escape and perhaps take the place of the weak and aging father. Freud points out that the person diagnosed with dementia praecox behaves as if castrated, and that literal self-castrations are not uncommon among those profoundly disturbed with dementia praecox. The next social change was characterized by the brothers joining together, fleeing the brutal father, and uh, allying with one another in the struggle for survival. This alliance could have resulted in homosexual satisfactions, which were then sublimated into social feeling, that is, fraternity, and the basis for all later societies. This social structure corresponds to paranoia with its secret alliances and the important role of a persecutor. Paranoia wards off homosexuality, the basis for the union of the brothers. 
drives the paranoiac out of society and destroys his social sublimations. In the next phase, the brothers overpower and kill the brutal primal father. They triumph over his death and mourn him as the revered father that he was. This mourning comes about only because there was an identification with the father. The triumph following the primal father's death and the mourning over the loss later became inverted in the mourning over the death of the father king God and the triumph or celebration over his resurrection in religious festivals. This mourning and triumph Freud associates with depression and elation in melancholia mania. As Freud explained to Ferenzi in a letter dated July 12, 1915, quote, what are now neuroses were once phases in human conditions. Heza Roheim, who conducted field studies among the Aboriginal peoples of Central Australia on Normanby Island and among the Yuma, modified Freud's vision of our ancient past by eliminating psycholamarchism. In, it, in its place, he offered an ontogenetic perspective. People did what they did over and over again, not because they remembered it from their phylogenetic past, but because it was in the structure of their beings and a response to the childhood traumata of their personal lives. Roheim wrote, quote, Humanity has emerged as a human being emerges today by the growth of defense mechanisms against the infantile situation, by the development of the unconscious, unquote. He said further, quote, with the discovery that certain peoples have certain habits in their treatment of their children that produce traumata analogous to those discovered in analysis, we have a new method for explaining the characteristic features of their sociology. Rohan, digging deep into the ontogenetic perspective, asserts that the functions of child development and child rearing create their own natural traumata and that when certain groups of people develop specific child-rearing strategies and styles of life, these influence not only the psychology of the individual child, but the sociology of the group in its myths and its rituals and even the emergence of mankind from the anthropoids and prehumans. The ontogenetic perspective helps us to see that the origins of culture are derived from the very human nature of childhood and child rearing and child rearing and that this cause is permanent universal and at the same time historic the ontogenetic perspective allows us to elaborate the reconstruction of the primal horde as it dispenses with the concept of a group mind that remembers its phylogenetic past Roheim said that, quote, we approach our human environment through our infantile anxiety situations or defense mechanisms erected on the basis of these anxiety situations, unquote. The phylogenetic project of psychoanalysis has sought to understand the relationship between psychological development and cultural evolution. In the process, it has made, it has taken, uh, it has made many errors, but we should learn from those errors without having to abandon the project entirely. Modern genetics forces us to abandon psycho-Lamarckian positions that Freud maintained all his life. The memories of experience, even if they were repeated millions of times, will not enter DNA and will not be genetically inherited from one generation to the next. The Haeckelian biogenetic law, which states that the individual repeats the evolution of its species in anatomic form or the history and prehistory of its species in psychological form, is incorrect. The formal similarities between human history and prehistory on the one hand and psychological development on the other are either due to the common factor of human psychological structure being present in both fields or to a variety of other parallel modes 
of information transmission. More about this later, but for now, it is enough to say that the biogenetic law collapses because not all ontogenetic stages are represented in phylogeny, and not all phylogenetic stages are represented in ontogeny, and phylogenetic evolution is not a cause of ontogenetic development. Related to the problems of the psycholomarchian position is Freud's notion of symbols in a collective mind. Both notions imply that the archaic symbolism found in dreams, fantasies, art, myth, and religion are platonic forms existing a priori in the brain and or somehow in the air, and that these symbols, or the capacity to locate them, are inherited from one generation to the next. While these notions of the inheritance of symbols are experienced near, theoretically, they're flatly incorrect. Symbols do not exist in the ether, they are not inherited genetically. They are constructed psychologically. Of course, Jung had his concept of a collective unconscious. Freud rejected that, but he did. Freud had his own term. He referred to a collective mind. And I've studied this very, very closely to try to determine this distinction that Freud made between his collective mind and the collective unconscious. And there is a distinction, but it is very, very thin. Uh, they, they were both thinking pretty in a pretty similar way, much to Ernest Jones' dismay. Ernest Jones had a very modern view of uh, symbolism as early as 1911. So, uh, and, and he was always arguing with Freud, you know, please don't go on and on with that uh, cycle of Marxism because it's just old-fashioned. It was out. Of, it was out of date. It was old-fashioned before Freud wrote Totem and Taboo. It was already out of date 20 years, I think it was the 1880s or 1890, something like that, when uh, the Psycholomarchian position was uh, recognized as not being a sufficient explanatory uh, concept. The limits of the comparative method in anthropology have been demonstrated, and we can see that two cultures that have the same tradition have it for different reasons or as a function of different histories. Formal similarities need not imply similarities of history or meaning. The notion that an original matriarchy was followed by patriarchy is another theory that fell hard when the literal definitions of matriarchy and patriarchy met the facts of field anthropology. Freud's ahistoricism is a legitimate criticism, especially in the light of his increasingly literal interpretation and belief in his own reconstruction of our ancient past. The relationship between Aboriginal people and children is based primarily on some similar modes of cognitive operations, which are extremely interesting and relevant to our examination of the relationship between psychological development and cultural evolution. But to equate primitive people, including Aboriginal adults, with children is frankly ethnocentric. Aboriginal adults are not children. They demonstrate complex adult behavior, adult roles, and adult sexuality. The equations we draw must be qualified to avoid confusion. Similarly, Aboriginal peoples are also not neurotics in general, or obsessive compulsives in particular. We have to understand the nature of the comparisons Freud made between cultural institutions and neurotic defensive strategies and also understand the limits of those comparisons. Based on the above criticisms, one might ask, why pursue this phylogenetic project of psychoanalysis any further? But there are two aspects worth noticing. One is that the analogical relations between our ancient ancestors, contemporary Aboriginal peoples, children, neurotics, myths, rituals, and dreams are too compelling to ignore. And the other is that if we had a better understanding of the analogical relation between these disparate phenomena, particularly the basis of the transmission of symbols and psychological dynamics from one generation to the next, we might be able to revive the phylogenetic project of psychoanalysis and give it new meaning in a new context. <coughs> 
Freud often spoke without true understanding of the genetic transmission of psychological traits. While genetics do play a role, more has been attributed to genetics than is justified. For example, using a more sophisticated understanding of genetics, the Menekers and Lumsden and Wilson have made a strong case for psychological capacities based in anatomical structure being evolutionary advances and being passed on from one generation to the next through genetic uh, transmissions. But these uh, capacities naturally include the symbolic function, the capacity to speak, the social instincts, concentration, memory, etc. Those have been passed on genetically. These capacities are significantly different from our primate cousins. They are capacities which evolved as a function of mutations, were selected naturally and sexually, and were passed on genetically from one generation to the next. Have we gone on evolving at a genetic level during the last 30 or 40,000 years? Of course we have, but I suspect not significantly very much. While racial differences seem to have developed during that period, these are fairly small anatomical differences and do not appear to be associated with cognitive differences at all. A Yanomami baby born in the Venezuelan jungles adopted at birth and raised in New York City would be a New Yorker. And a baby born in Manhattan, adopted at birth and raised among the Yanomami, would of course be a Yanomami. Our genetic evolution during the last 30 or 40,000 years or more has varied very little, while our cultural evolution has turned us all into members of pseudo-species. So how has culture evolved? And what is the method of transmission that culture, uh, of, of that cultural evolution? Well, for one, we can say that in a sense, knowledge is Lamarckian in that it is a set of acquired characteristics which are passed on to the next generation. But knowledge is not passed on genetically, but socially through language and the written word. And while it is passed on like a Lamarckian acquisition, it is often internalized through recapitulation, whereby one must recapitulate the development or history of mathematics, a language, a science, etc., to learn this material. Technology is also Lamarckian insofar as each generation acquires the technology of the previous generation and neither acquires it through genetics nor academic recapitulation, but through direct material inheritance of the object, of the house, the plow, the wheel, the lever, the furnace, the clock, the computer, etc. Knowledge is recapitulated and technology is materially inherited. One must learn basic math in order to do calculus, but one need not know how a television works to know how to turn one on. Psychological defense mechanisms are based on genetically determined capacities, but reinforced by technology and social conditions. With language, the written word, books, higher mathematics, and philosophy, I don't think we are taking too much of a leap by suggesting that there might be more rationalizers and intellectualizers today than there were during the Paleolithic era. Similarly, one might imagine that there would be fewer restraints on acting out, splitting, projection, and magical thinking during the Paleolithic than there are in modern urban environments. The transmission of social structure to psychological structure is partly due to genetics, but largely due to other factors, such as language, customs knowledge, technology, and the natural and social environment. Consequently, the similarities and analogical correspondences between psychological development and cultural evolution are often a function of the interplay of these factors. Roheim dismissed Freud's phylogenetic inheritance of acquiristics and demonstrated that the recurrent themes of totemism and religions in general are due to ontogenetic factors. We didn't inherit those experiences. We are all human, and so we reinvent them anew from one generation to the next. 
a culture with particular child rearing techniques will create specific types of traumatic experiences in its children. These common experiences will then be socialized into customs and beliefs which will characterize the culture and continue to be passed on, not genetically, but through child rearing practices, customs, belief, and language. Indulgent parenting strategies, feeding and toilet training on schedule, permissiveness, corporal punishment, restrictive attitudes toward child uh, infant mobility, mechanical parental responsiveness, chaotic and enmeshed sleeping and feeding practices, anxious attitudes towards masturbation, and other sexual practices will all create traumata of one form or another. To the extent that child rearing practices are uniform within a particular culture, those traumata will form adult attitudes toward work, sex, family, social religion, so social relations, and religious points of view. Complex is not a million experiences remembered in distilled form from our common distant path, past. It is the metaphor of socialization, recreated anew each time a baby is born. Freud was not unaware of this ontogenetic viewpoint. In fact, he asserted it long before Roheim. But unlike Roheim, Freud carried the ontogenetic explanation together with his phylogenetic.